Hello everyone. Um, this is going to be a series of videos in which uh, I want to explore the possibilities of black against sharp gambit lines offered by white. Um, there is a dearth, if you like, uh, in, in chess material of a complete comprehensive study of, of all the gambits and their variations from solely from Black's point of view. There is a lot of material on, um, on the gambits uh, on the internet, on YouTube. J. Roby has some excellent videos about some traps that Black can have uh, waiting for White if White declines. Um, if you're interested in uh, gambits and traps in Europe, let's play online. I suggest you look at those videos. There are also um, numerous analyses of various games by many YouTubers, which are uh, pretty cool. Now, I'm not a very experienced chess player and, or a strong chess player. I'm a hobbyist chess player, and uh, while playing with Black, I have often encountered that young players um, tend to play sharp gambit lines instead of, say, uh, Rui Lopez or, um, or entering into Knight Orf's variations. Um, and I haven't found a comprehensive guide that tells Black how to play against the gambit. So I just want to explore these uh, lines from solely from, from Black's um, perspective and, uh, as it were, to build a repertoire for Black playing against White's gambit lines. So if you're a hobbyist player, you know, these uh, videos may interest you. For part one, I've chosen King's Gambit, and there are two ways of playing it. King's Gambit accepted and King's Gambit declined. Um, now, King's Gambit in ECO code starts from C30 and ends on C39, so there are lots and lots of variations. And I, of course, I can't enter all of these in my repertoire, so I've chosen some. So for King's Gambit's accepted, we have uh, two main variations, King's Knight's Gambit and King's Bishop's Gambit. Uh, in King's Knight's Gambit, Black can reply in a number of ways, um, and uh, a Bezier defense, Quaid Gambit, and Kaiseretsky variation are my favorites. In King's Bishop's Gambit lines, there is uh, Rui Lopez defense, and then there is Chigurin's attack. Whereas in King's Gambit declined, we have the Falkbeer Counter Gambit. Now these are uh, the lines that I want to explore, and these uh, are from my repertoire. I guess I have um, I have added all these lines to my repertoire, and I want to experiment with these. So let me show you first of all what King's Gambit is. King's Gambit starts with the King's Pawns game, e4, e5. And when white offers its f pawn to black, that is where the gambit starts. And e takes f4, that's king's gambit accepted. Now, as white's third move, white can choose to play knight f3, which would be the king's knight's gambit, or bishop to c4, which is the king's bishop's gambit. Now, Knight f3 is king's uh, knight's gambit, which we're going to explore in this in this uh, video. And uh, the the response line to knight f3 that I want to explore specifically in this video is called the Abasia defense, which is d5. So e4, e5, f4, e takes f4, knight f3, d5. That's Abasia defense. Of course, if white plays bishop c4, we have Chigurin's attack. And that's uh, what I'm going to explore in, the, uh, in, in another video coming up very soon, hopefully. So d5, the Abasia defense, 
and one response instead of the Bayesian defense like I talked in the in the introduction a couple of minutes ago is G5 which is called the Quaid's Gambit so but we're not going to explore this line just yet D5 now what's the idea behind this line of course, uh, the general idea behind any gambit lines from White's perspective is to open up the files, uh, mobilize all the pieces, get the initiative going, you know, attack uh, mercilessly. And the, the main focus of most of the gambits are the central squares. So this is where most of the battle takes place. So I like this idea of countering uh, the center forces of white right away from black's perspective. So what Abasia defense does right away is to challenge this pawn on e4 and to ask, okay, so what, what you gonna do? Are you gonna take it or are you gonna refute it and do something else? Now in various continuations, um, well, Spassky took this pawn more than often, and in various continuations, White sometimes chooses even not to take this pawn. Here's a game that I played. Um, I chose this game to show you the the, the prelims of uh, this defense uh, of the Abasia defense because it's a it's a very normal game played between normal hobbyist club players, you know, nothing very special. But just exploring the possibilities from black side. I chose to play the Abasia defense and I think it's pretty playable for black. This is one move that, um, you know, you can enter into your repertoire and you can say, okay, this is a good move, you know. So let's see from the start once again, e4, e5, that's the king's pawns game. f4, that's the king's gambit. E takes f4, king's gambit accepted. KGA. Knight f3, that's king's knight's gambit. So king's gambit accepted, king's knight's gambit. The reply d5, Abasia defense. Now the game went like this. E takes d5, my opponent took. I brought my knight out to f6 attacking his pawn on d5. Again, the idea is to attack the central forces of white. And um, he brought his knight out to defend. Now, I brought my bishop out, my king's bishop, to c5. Now, this is actually a mistake, but what I wanted to do, the idea that I had in mind, and um, I was, you know, struggling under the pressure of the clock. It was a 10 minutes game, played it online. So I just, you know, I had one idea in my mind, to attack along the C5, G1 diagonal, uh, to not to let the white king castle anytime sooner, you know. And uh, a straightaway reply to this is to push the the D pawn up to the fourth rank right away and I would have lots of problems but my opponent not chose chose not to do that and instead continued with bishop b5 attacking my king bishop b5 check I defended with my queen's bishop he took I took back with the knight with queen's knight so it's knight knight b takes d7 uh, then he pushed his pawn up to d4, attacking my bishop. Instead of taking it, now do you notice that our light square bishops um, are gone. They are off the board. You know, I have some possibilities. So I checked him with the queen. He blocked with the knight. So some material was exchanged here. And I took, finally I took back with the queen, with the check and he blocked with his queen. I brought my bishop up to d4, and he took on f4 with his bishop. I took on uh, c3 with my bishop, c3 check, bishop c3, bishop takes c3 check. He took back, 
I exchanged the coins and the game went on. And so we are exploring the Abasia defense in King's Gambit accepted, King's Knight's Gambit, e4, e5, f4, e takes f4, knight f3, and d5. This is the main line for Abasia defense, d5. So let's look at this game played between uh, Mr. Boris Paskey and Mr. Bronstein, uh, where uh, Bronstein was black and Spassky was white and Bronstein chose to play the Abasia defense. Now Bronstein lost this game, uh, but uh, analyzing this game, we'll be able to figure out uh, you know, some main ideas behind gambits generally, and some ideas behind uh, the D5 line, the main line for Abasia defense. Now Mr. Boris Alterman has got an excellent gambit guide out. Uh, he's got many lectures in there. <clears throat> have only got into the lecture number 17 and he talks about ideas behind gambits and analyzes lots of games but from white's perspective mostly so i urge you to look at that as well now i feel quite out of league to you know analyzing this game played between the grandmasters but still um i'll get out of it what i can you know according to my skill level and if I make a mistake, please correct me. So e4, e5, f4, e takes f4, knight f3, d5. And uh, Mr. Spassky now took this pawn on d5. So he takes d5. Now Bronstein brought his uh, bishop out to d6. Knight c3 was the reply from Mr. Spassky. Now King's Knight brought out to e7. Please note this here, we'll come back to this in a minute, but please note where uh, Bronstein is placing his pieces and really losing the tempi, you know, losing the initiative. Uh, Mr. Boris Alterman talks about uh, the main idea behind any gambit, and that is to develop your pieces very quickly and very rapidly to the best available squares towards the center, and um, at the same time to keep the initiative. Instead of trying to just develop passively, you have to be aggressive while playing a gambit. I think I'll agree to that. So d4, now this is another idea in uh, the King's Gambit accepted lines to push the D pawn up the board at some point in time in the game. Bronstein castles short and uh, Spassky brings his uh, King's Bishop out to D3. Knight D7, castles, H6. I want you to pause here for a second and just look at the board. Look at black's position. The Abasia defense is a very playable line for black, at least as far as I have experienced it and as far as I have studied other others' games, grandmasters' games. Uh, but if you look at the board right now, you can see that all of Mr. Bronstein's, almost all of Mr. Bronstein's pieces are resting on their home racks. And so uh, if we were to look at the influence of Mr. Bronstein's army on the board, what we have is this bishop slicing through the board, perhaps the only active piece currently. And do we have any other uh, major piece cutting through the board? No. This bishop here on c8 is blocked. The rooks are blocked in. And then uh, we have the knight. These two knights here have some squares. And so this is pretty much it, you know. 
I would say that black, uh, black is limited to the fifth rank at the most. You know, this is the rank that blacks influences to the most. But most of uh, black species are resting in their home ranks, and there is, I don't see any initiatives for, for black here. I don't see any counterplay for black. And with the exception of this pawn, which is an advanced pawn, but it's very weak, and we're gonna see in a minute that uh, it's not gonna do any good to Mr. Bronstein's play. So the game continues, knight e4, now uh, Mr. Spassky brings his knight to the center of the board, very strong square, e4, and uh, this knight is pretty dangerous, so uh, Bronstein has to get rid of it and quick. Knight takes d5, c4, knight e3, takes with the bishop, bishop takes e3, f takes e3. Now this pawn is very, very weak. This pawn is, there is absolutely no way that um, Bronstein can defend this pawn. At the same time, if we look at the 12th move, which is 12 c5 and bishop e7, now with the exception of this pawn, all of Bronstein's pieces are resting in their home ranks, you know, in the first two ranks. So you see this bishop here at e7, locked in. It has uh, a little influence towards uh, these two diagonals, the e7, h4, and e7, a3 diagonals. But other than that, I think it's pretty passive. It's not attacking or doing anything. Uh, then we have the knight, which is pretty passive too. Just has a couple of attacking squares. Here, here, and here. And isn't really doing much. Other than these two pieces, there is absolutely no piece of black which is in the game. And that is very, very important to note. I think that is the biggest mistake black can make while playing King's Gambit accepted. And as far as I can see, I mean, for the first time, when I saw this game for the first time, reaching to the 12th move, I saw that black was lost, you know? I didn't know the outcome and I was watching it on a, on a Java applet. Uh, which which showed uh, game of the day and didn't tell me uh, who versus who uh, the game is and uh, what is the outcome of the game and so I was watching the game I was uh, you know hitting the play button and just watching it and I knew that black is lost here you know no initiatives no counterplay so 13 bishop c2 and rook e8 now tries to bring his rook, uh, Bronstein tries to, play, uh, to bring his rook to um, an open file. Queen d3. Now, please note, this is a very dangerous battery towards the king that uh, Mr. Spassky has formed. And we'll see in a minute a very brilliant sacrifice made uh, by Mr. Spassky to open up this diagonal and uh, remove, the, uh, remove his own knight from blocking the queen and the bishop. e2 pushes the pawn, desperate try I would say, desperate try to uh, gain at least some momentum, but too late, too late. Knight d6, and this is the uh, sacrifice idea that I was talking about earlier. Now this knight here cannot be taken. And do you see why? If c takes d6, then queen h7 mate. So you can't take this knight. And um, I think knight f8 uh, is a poor reply. Analysis shows that uh, knight f, um, f6 was a better reply, nevertheless. Now the knight attacks the g7 pawn, 
sorry, F, F7 pawn, and the game is over. Nowhere to run. E takes F1, promoted to queen. Again, another desperate try, check. Rook takes, now bishop comes out to F5. Queen takes, queen to D7, queen to F4, bishop F6, knight 3, E5, and the game is over. Here, black resigned. Hello everyone. This is um, third video on the Abasia defense, and this is another game that Branch team played, but this time playing with White. And his opponent is a very very strong chess player. Uh, but Venek, of course, all of you know him. Uh, and but Venek in this game chose to play a Bezier defense. And it's a very, very interesting game. Let's see what happened here. Now, this was uh, played in Russia in 1952. So it's a, uh, it's a game uh, which took place before the other game of Bronstein versus Spassky that we saw in the last video. Just wanted to show you the main ideas and how Botwinnik developed his pieces. e4, e5, that's the king's pawns game, like we've been talking about. f4, main line for king's gambit. e takes f4, that's king's gambit accepted. Knight f3, king's knight's gambit, and d5. This is the Abasia defense. And e takes d5. Bronstein takes. And now, but Vinnick develops his king's knight on the square f6, as opposed to Bronstein in the game that we viewed in the, in the last video, who developed his knight on e7. Now, as you can see, both of these moves have the same idea of attacking that central pawn, the idea that continues from the main line of, um, of a Bayesian attack. But, but Winnick, being a very strong chess player, you know, Braunstein is a very strong chess player too, and he has an excellent, excellent rating um, and average while playing um, King's Gambit, and he's won many, many games playing King's Gambit accepted. But here we see uh, a little superior, a little more superior um, imagination from Botwinnik. And he's placed the knight on f6, which is a more active square. It's uh, going towards the center. And it's an ideal, uh, ideal spot for the knight. And so bishop b5, check, c, uh, c6. To defend, d takes c6, and b takes c6. Now this pawn cannot be captured, it's backed up by the knight on b8. Bishop c4 has to retreat somewhere, so finds the square c4. Knight d5. Now another main idea of um, of playing the gambits for black to not lose the initiative. So this is the first move, I think, first move of the game in which, uh, from which black starts to gain the tempi, you know, blocking the bishop right away. And uh, again, we see that main idea of, uh, of King's Gambit accepted, D pawn being pushed up to the fourth rank. Now Bishop D6, another good square for, for the bishop now, castles short, but Venek castles short. Knight C3, Knight takes C3, Bish uh, sorry, pawn takes C3, B takes C3, and now, Bishop g4, pinning the knight with the queen, breaks the pin, knight d7, 
And now here, I want you to pause for a moment and compare this position of black with the game that we saw before. Now we can see almost all of black's pieces are well de developed. We have this knight, uh, this sorry, this bishop here on g4, this bishop here on d6, this knight here on d7. We have this pawn up on, uh, on f4, this pawn here on c6. And these rooks can come into action very quickly. So this knight has its influence on these squares in the center. It's going towards the center. At the same time, this bishop is slicing through this uh, c8, h3 diagonal. Also cutting through this uh, diagonal here, which is g4, d1 diagonal, d1, g4 diagonal. Um, then we have this bishop, the dark squared bishop, cutting through the board again. This bishop is actually placed at the same place where Bronstein placed uh, his bishop in the previous game that we saw. But here it's backed up by other pieces as well. And we have the queen which can come out to, to play in just one move. Then we have the rooks coming out to open files in just one move each. And so we see that um, Black has actually lots of counterplay here. He has uh, lots of good squares to go to move his pieces to, and his pieces are well placed. Compare this or contrast this to the Black's position in the previous game, and you'll see the main idea behind Gambit's to not to lose the initiative. So the game continued, g3, knight b6, attacking the bishop, bishop retreats to b3, c5, c4, queen f6, knight e5. You can see that black is countering very well. It's an excellent, excellently playable line for black, the Bayesian defense. Bishop takes e5, d takes e5, now queen takes e5, bishop takes f4, queen moves to h5, Rook f e1, brought to the open file. Rook f e8, uh, f e8, challenging that uh, rook placed on the open file. a4, bishop e2, now attacking the queen. And uh, queen c3, knight d7, a5, knight f6, bishop a4, Rook e6, king g2, knight e4. And you can already see, you know, this, this game is lost for white. Queen a3, g5, and white resigns. Let's see some possible continuations. Say bishop takes g5 here. Then queen takes g5. Queen, say, comes to uh, c1. And the queen can comfortably go back to h5. And um, as you can see, black is up a piece and winning very easily. It's a very dynamic uh, situation. And what black has clear advantage, and he's going to mate in a few, few moves. But say bishop doesn't take g5. What are the other replies? Bishop e3, OK. Queen, f3, if king h3, the only good square for uh, for the king, then rook h6, mate. Hello and welcome to the last video in the series of um, Kings, Knights, Gambit, Abasia Defense. This is a game played between Swanson and John Nunn in the late uh, 70s. Swanson was white and John Nunn was black. Interesting game. Um, becomes a Bayesian defense by transposition. So 
the game went like this f4 birds opening e5 swiss gambit e4 e takes f4 that is king's gambit by transposition knight f3 king's knight's gambit d5 a basia defense e takes d5 knight f6 we saw in the pre previous videos that uh, this move is better than knight e7 bishop b5 c6 defending against the check d takes c6 and now john nun chooses here to take with the knight instead of the pawn as we saw in the previous video knight takes c6 now if you see here if you if you pause for a moment and look at the board you can see that black has developed his pieces very very nicely uh, both his knights are resting on ideal squares from where they can uh, they have access to the center of the board and can jump to any of these squares also we see that the files have been ripped open so this is a completely open file, the e-file. Uh, we have, from Black's perspective, a semi-open d-file. We have a semi-open c-file. And the b-file is going to be opened very soon, and the rook can come to it. This bishop here already has this diagonal available to him. This one has this diagonal. So both bishops, although in their home ranks, have uh, some mobility available to them and then and can come into the play very very quickly from white's perspective we have the semi open f file and so uh, the three basic rules of gambit play which is to open up the files as soon as possible to develop your pieces rapidly to the best available squares and to not lose initiative have been utilized by John Nunn in this game and black has uh, a superior position in my opinion uh, in this uh, at this moment in game if we look at white we can see that most of his pieces are blocked in both rooks are locked. This knight has yet to find an ideal square. And the only square available to this knight is c3 at the moment. This bishop is locked in badly. Queen has a diagonal available to it, but is blocked by the knight here. And so its mobility is limited. This knight, however, is placed uh, relatively better and has some access to the center of the board. But other than that, white is in a pretty bad shape. So um, there is no point in playing a gambit line if, if you're not going to develop your pieces rapidly. The game continued. After knight takes c6, queen e2, check, bishop e7, blocks, d4, and this is... Uh, the main, a main idea, one of the main ideas in King's uh, Knight's Gambit, or in King's Gambit generally, to push up the D pawn to fourth rank, as we've seen previously as well. Castle's short, Bishop takes C6, and B takes C6, castles. Now, after castling, this is the middle game now. And in middle game as well, you can see the that black pieces have more mobility than the white's pieces and they are placed better on the board bishop g4 pinning the queen queen c4 breaking the pin bishop d6 knight c3 Rook c8, king h1. King h1 move is probably a, a preemption of these two batteries here. So a silent but good move by Swanson. Knight d5, 
ideal square for the bishop for the knight I'm sorry Knight's potential is maximized on this square. This is, uh, of course, realized by Swenson, and he takes. Nun brings his bishop to e6, pinning the queen. And so um, queen d3 breaks the pin. Otherwise, uh, he would have a problem. C takes d5. So uh, Nun here takes the knight back. C3 f6, bishop d2, queen d7, and with each move you can see that black is developing his pressure on the white side. b3, bishop f5, queen a6, g5, rook a, e1, bishop e4, queen a5, queen f5, bishop c1, rook f e8, c4, d takes c4, queen takes f5, bishop takes f5. This is now the end game with the queens coming off the board. And we can see that, um, we can see clearly black has um, a pawn's advantage, he's a pawn up. And at the same time, uh, there are two bishops of black versus a knight and the bishop of white. Uh, which in theory is always better. It's better to have two bishops against a knight and a bishop. Also, we can see that um, black's pieces are well placed, are better placed, more dynamically placed, and none has a better chance at winning this game. Rook takes e8, rook takes back, b takes c4, Bishop d3, rook e1, rook takes e1, knight takes e1. Now none realizes uh, that with this exchange of rooks, he's forcing uh, white to take back with the knight. And e1 is a very bad square for knight, and he's forced into a defensive position. Bishop takes c4, a3, king f7, now kings come into the play, king g1, this is the end game now, king e6, king f2, king d5, bishop b2, bishop c7, king f3, h5, h3, so blocking always for the king, f5, knight c2, g4, king f2, a5, king e1, bishop b3, knight a1. I'm sorry, knight a1 move was not played in the actual game. I was just looking at some uh, continuations. Bishop b3, and white resigns here. Swanson lost the game. And you can clearly see why, you know, this, this um, pawn here, white pawn, the only passed pawn, uh, has no defenders left. And the knight is under attack currently. The knight, though can move to uh, the only available square, a1, which is a pretty bad square for the knight, uh, to say the least. Um, this bishop can come back to c4. At the same time, um, there's also the law of two weaknesses coming into play very soon. These two pawns are going towards f1 square to be promoted. You know, if uh, g takes, h3, then g takes h3, and these two pawns, pawns are passed pawns. These are backed up by this, this bishop, which can come up to both these diagonals. And very soon, uh, the bishop first can come to the b6 square and tag this pawn here, get rid of it, um, exchanging the pair of bishops, exchanging these two bishops, and uh, this bishop here on b3 can move back. And at some point when this pawn here on f4 has been pushed up to f3, um, this bishop can come here and influence uh, lots of squares from here. 
So this was an interesting game that I thought I'd share with you. Thank you for watching all my videos. And in the next video, we'll start looking at the Quake Gambit.